And welcome along to DigiShift 54, how to use digital technologies sustainably. So today we're going to be talking about digital technologies and how they contribute to climate change and how you can use tech in a more sustainable way, both personally and in your own organisation. We're going to be joined today by Hannah Smith, who's a freelance sustainable web consultant living in Exmoor. Um, Hannah has previously worked in uh, a lot of WordPress development um, with SMEs, but also for the Environment Agency where she managed large business change product, uh, projects. She's now co-founder of Green Tech Southwest, founder of Let's Green the Web campaign, and that's run in conjunction with climateaction.tech. She's also a Green Web Foundation fellow. So today we're going to be exploring how we can understand the climate and environmental impacts of digital technologies and how you can reduce some of those impacts personally and in your own organisation. So I'll hand over to you just now, Hannah. Right, sorry about that. I lost my uh, <laughs> lost my cursor there for a minute. I've got two screens. So, hi everybody. Uh, thanks so much uh, for for joining today. Um, just bear with me. I'm just going to share some slides, which is going to be super fun because I keep losing my mouse. So, uh, <laughs> two ticks whilst I get those up for you. Um, because of my lighting situation, my other screen is over here. So, right here yeah, we go. It's very dark in the day in there. Yeah, it is. Oh, I, I live in an, a really old cottage and lighting is just an absolute nightmare here. And we have a very grey day as well. OK, so there's that. And then uh, there we go. Found you. All right. Can you all see some slides? Yes. Fantastic. You. And you can just about see me. I have an artistic shadow across my face today, but hopefully that's enough that you can you can see. So I'm going to aim to speak for, I don't know, about 15 minutes, because I'm assuming that many of you have never thought about this topic before or would be entirely new to this topic. So it only seems fair to give you a bit of a primer and to, to, to get you thinking about some of the key things. Um, Ross already did a fantastic introduction uh, for me there. So thank you very much, Ross. I guess the only other thing I'd say is that I live uh, in Exmoor, in, a, in the National Park of Exmoor, which is down in the southwest. And I really like dogs. And you heard all the other things already. Um, so what am I going to cover in this morning's introduction? So first of all, I'm going to give you a, a definition that I tend to use um, for, for when I'm talking about what sustainability is. I'm going to talk to you and give you some ideas about how digital can be unsustainable. And throughout the, the, the primer, I'm going to give you some ideas about ways you can make digital more sustainable. I think when you define what something is, it's very helpful to define what it isn't. So what this talk isn't is hating on digital tech, software or the Internet. Um, the general point of view I'm coming from is that these things make the world a better place. They give us lots and lots of possibilities and lots and lots of solutions. So my viewpoint is that tech is, in, is good, it can be used for bad, but it's a good thing. And I mean, I've got 15 minutes to introduce you to this topic, which I probably could talk about for a whole week. So it's not a comprehensive masterclass and I'm just trying to give you some ideas and some food for thought. So let's get into it. So when I talk about sustainability, um, here's, the, here's the starting place that I come from. Um, so the definition that I tend to work with is that sustainability is all about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So it's very much about long-term thinking, thinking about how, what we're doing today and how that impacts future generations tomorrow. And that definition comes from something called the Brundtland Report. Um, some of you maybe have heard of it. Uh, it was written in 1987, so it's been around a little while now. Um, and within that report, it talks about three key pillars. Now, the thing is with sustainability, as I'm sure many of you are aware, sustainability is a hugely complex topic. So the Brundtland Report does talk about these three key pillars. But it's important to understand that these three key pillars are intrinsically linked. 
So it's very difficult to talk about one of these pillars without somehow finding interdependencies with the other pillars. But it's useful to sort of compartmentalize things to some degree. So the first pillar probably comes of no, as no surprise is around the environment or natural resources. The second pillar is around economics and governance, so decision making. And the third is around social, so people, how people behave. And the first thing I'd like to impress upon you is that when we're talking about sustainability of any type, and particularly when we're talking about sustainability in the digital tech sector, sustainability is a lot more than just carbon emissions. Sustainability is a whole variety of factors that do include carbon emissions, natural resource, but that also include things like um, health and education. So it's a very broad topic. So if people are talking about the decarbonisation of tech, they might be talking about reducing the carbon emissions that arise from tech. And, and we'll talk about how tech makes carbon emissions shortly. But it would be helpful for you to keep in your mind that sustainability is a little bit white. I say a little bit. I mean, that's a typical British kind of understatement, isn't it? <laughs> it's massively wider than carbon emissions. OK, so. We hopefully are all on a similar page now to what sustainability means or how we might define sustainability. Let's talk a little bit about how digital tech itself is unsustainable and, and how it contributes to making, the fu making future generations have less than we do today. So you probably can't see the detail of this diagram on the right, and that's absolutely fine. It's really just the colours for you to have a look at. Now, what many people don't always perhaps appreciate when they're looking at digital, they're looking at software, is this, the layers of infrastructure that sit underneath um, a software or, or a website. And so this diagram on the right is something that I'm working on with the Green Web Foundation. And we've called it a, sun to site, a site to sun map. And the idea of this diagram is to give you an idea of the different layers of infrastructure that are present when we try and run a piece of software or, or, or run a website. And the different colours represent different categories. So the purple stuff, you can see those little purple boxes at the top, those represent content and the blue represents software. And for the majority of people, all they see are the blue and the, uh, the purple boxes near the top. It's kind of a bit like an iceberg the infrastructure that digital tech relies on. There's an awful lot beneath the surface. And everything below that is infrastructure. And the reason why I'm showing you this diagram and trying to make this point to you is because what many people often don't realize is that creating and running that infrastructure uses lots of natural resources. So that infrastructure covers things like data centers. It covers things like the cables that we have that connect, um, connect us from A to B. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but this is a short talk, so I'm not gonna go into it, but if anyone wants to ask me questions at the end about this, you definitely can, I'm happy to get into it. So the point I want to get to you is this iceberg, the stuff that we perhaps don't see underneath uses lots of natural resources. So it needs energy to, to run, uh, a lot of the time, I believe 60% of the world's uh, energy still comes from fossil fuels. And it also, uh, but we also have renewables and we have nuclear, but all of those do create an impact of some description. Um, physical hardware. So we have to actually manufacture this stuff um, and produce it. And that can be hugely damaging to the environment, particularly for mobile phones. So I'm sure many of you will have a, a smartphone or a mobile phone. Some of you may even have more than one. You may be on your fourth or fifth. Um, those mobile phones are actually very damaging to produce in themselves. Um, we don't always perhaps realize uh, the cost to the natural environment of uh, using those resources. And then data centers. I touched briefly on data centers already. Data centers actually require a surprising amount of land and water to run. You might be thinking water? In a data center around computers? What's that all about then? Well, those data centers have to be cooled because they're working so hard. Um, so data centers will require a lot of water. 
So there is a lot of hidden impact to all this digital stuff. And I think whoever came up with this idea that digital is in the cloud, um, you know, came, you know, uh, came up with something that, that that's resonated with a lot of people, but also perhaps gives the wrong impression about actually where your data lives and the, the impact that your data does have on the land around it. So I'm going to get a little more specific. Um, I think we're about halfway through the talk now. So I want to talk to you a little bit more specifically about how websites themselves create CO2 emissions and how that happens in practice. And hopefully that will give you some ideas as to the impact or the, the things that you can do in your different organisations. So coming back to that, those previous points I was making, um, digital services do create a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, greenhouse gas emissions do include carbon dioxide and, and other gases as well, um, but we'll talk mainly about carbon emissions. So it's estimated that ICT, ICT stands for Information Communication Technologies, it's estimated that ICT creates between 1.2 and 3.9 of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, maybe that's not that big a percentage, um, or what's the context for that? So to put that number into context, we can also think about it this way, that that percentage, if that was a country, ICT or digital would actually be the world's seventh biggest polluter. So I think that starts to hit home as just to how much is, is, uh, is happening as, our, as, our use, as a result of our use of tech. And it's also bigger than the emissions that arise from aviation. So I believe aviation is about 1.9%. So tech does contribute to more greenhouse gas emissions than aviation. Let's talk about how websites then specifically create carbon emissions. So when you load a website, you transfer data. And that data is things like the images, the videos in your site, and the code that you need in order to view that website on a page. That data that's transferred requires electricity. And so the amount of data that you send to load a website is directly proportional to the amount of electricity that is required to send and and convert that data into the website that you see ahead of you. And what we can then do is convert that electricity required into CO2 emissions. And we can use that, uh, we can do that using some data that comes from the grid called carbon intensity data. And that carbon intensity data tells us how much CO2 was created or was emitted when we created a unit of energy. So hopefully you can see there that the amount of data that we transfer to load a website directly equates to the CO2 emissions. So maybe you've heard people talk about heavy websites or, or websites that are slow to load. Websites that are slow to load typically are sending a lot of data for each page load. So if you are able to improve the performance of your website, you are able to also reduce the CO2 emissions as a result uh, 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 that that website creates. So data transfer equals CO2 emissions. So if you're a developer like me, hopefully you would be interested in performance and optimization. But perhaps if you're not a developer, this might make you understand why another very good reason for why performance and optimization is so important. Optimization and, and op performance and optimization also has knock-on benefits such as accessibility and making your site more available to other people. And I'll talk a tiny bit more about that at the end. If you're interested in this, you can have a look at the Sustainable Web Design uh, website. It has a great website about this. And if you're technical or work with dev teams, you might be able to use something called uh, a CO2JS package, which you can use to measure your own emissions on the fly. So the most powerful actions that you can take to reduce your carbon emissions. So I already talked to you about reducing the amount of data being generated and sent by your website. And I'll make these slides available to you. And there's lots of specifics at the end of these slides that you can look at to help you do that. 
You can, of course, also look at what electricity sources you and your supply chain uses. So a lot of people will switch their hosting to a hosting provider that uses renewable energy because that's a very powerful action. You can actually reduce the overall carbon emissions of your website by about 15% by, by switching your hosting provider. And usually that, that has no, no knock-on effect and no increase in price to you. Um, if you are a developer or if you are producing innovative or novel content, you should be thinking about supporting the least powerful device. So try and avoid flashy features. Um, generally, people are very happy when your website is, is, is still. Things don't need to move around and animate for you to give someone a good experience or to help someone find your content. And again, if you're a developer, you can look at um, scheduling tasks to run at lower times of carbon intensity. So a couple more slides from me. Um, so one thing that is worth be bearing in mind is that making things more efficient doesn't actually equate to sustainability can actually increase usage because the barriers reduce. Now, if you're a charity or working in a nonprofit, that's actually probably a really good thing. If you're getting more people to use your services and more people to access your content, then that is a good thing. But from a sustainability point of view, where we're trying to reduce the amount of resources going into tech, that's not such a good thing. I don't know if anyone here has heard of Jevons Paradox, um, but Jev Jevons Paradox talks particularly in tech about how when you make things more efficient, you find people use things more. So when we make internet run faster, we find that more people use it, which, as I mentioned before, can be a good thing. But when we're talking about sustainability, we get this kind of slight issue. So that brings me back to thinking about those two other sustainability pillars. And I mentioned those at the beginning. I mentioned that the two other pillars were economic and governance and social change. So I would like to leave you with a few thoughts around these pillars. The, the actions are less clear cut. So when you're looking at sustainability and you're thinking about social and economic issues, it's, it's less clear what to do. So when you're a developer and you're looking to reduce the amount of resources, you can perform, you can perform, op you can optimize your site, make it run faster. And that's a clear cut action but here's a little more murky. And I'm sure many of you will be aware that working with people, making decisions and long-term thinking is really tricky. It's hard to know if you're getting it right and there's no button to push where you're like, ping, there's the answer. So what I can leave you with are questions. And to be honest with you, that's where the digital tech sector is at the moment with thinking about these things. We're asking questions, questions like, Okay, well, what are we using digital for? Well, digital is typically an accelerator of solutions, or that's how I think about digital. And the questions we have to ask ourselves are, are which solutions are we choosing to accelerate? And more importantly, for whom? Who benefits from our solutions? Who stands to lose out? Whose needs are we ignoring? And that's often overlooked within tech. Who has the decision-making power? And who feels the burdens of this tech actually simply just existing? So I mentioned to you about resource use for tech. There are a lot of communities, particularly in disadvantaged countries or disadvantaged communities that really feel the burden of our tech simply just existing. So more tech is not necessarily a good thing. Um, and we need to talk about who. So this is something called power analysis. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, I would highly recommend a book called Design Justice Principles, which talks a lot more deeply about this stuff. I can leave you with some practical steps um, around this stuff. So first up, do recognize that sustainability and decarbonization are not the same thing. They are different. Try not to muddle those two things up. Be transparent about your own ecological and social policies and your journey. So one of the best pieces of advice I can give any organization that wants to improve the sustainability of their digital tech is simply be honest and transparent about what you do and what you don't know, what you can and what you can't do at the moment. That really, really goes a long way. Try and provide transparency about the companies involved in your supply chain in the same way as you're being transparent about yourself 
be transparent about the companies in your supply chain. I don't know how relevant this is to you, but B Corp, B Corp certification is a great way of uh, helping to resolve these issues. And also be transparent about your ownership and your shareholders. Something I am just an absolute complete fan of is donor economics. I don't know if anybody's heard of donor economics before or has perhaps used or engaged with it. If you haven't, I really highly recommend it as a model for thinking more holistically about sustainability and about the actions that you can take. And I'm currently in the process of just finishing off a project which is using donor economics and applying that to tech as well. So keep your eyes peeled for doing the donut.tech, which hopefully I'll be able to get out there at the end of, of uh, May. Um, one of the things I absolutely love about donor economics is how easily accessible uh, you can find the content. So I recommend the Donor Economics Action Lab. If you don't feel like reading the book, there's loads of brilliant videos by Kate, Kate Rayworth, who's the originator of this concept. And Kate is an absolute legend, she's brilliant. So I leave you with a few final thoughts. So when people come to thinking about what building a sustainable internet means or what building sustainable digital technology means, they often start on the left-hand side of this diagram. So they often start thinking, well, the way we do this is that we build tech more efficiently. We use renewable energy and then we buy offsets. And actually, Sustainability is far more complex than that and is far more interwoven than that. So actually, when we're looking at sustainability, we are looking at diverse technical workforces. We are looking at regenerative business models. We're looking at accessible tech. So actually making tech available to more people and more fringe communities. And there's a whole list of other things there. I won't read them all out to you because I'm conscious of time. I've actually taken 20 minutes. So summing up. Making software greener or making digital tech greener is not just a tool and code problem. And anybody that tries to persuade you otherwise, I'm afraid I don't think really understands the full breadth of what sustainability is. Making digital tech greener actually requires us to human better. I hope you forgive the term. I haven't yet found a, a, a short way of saying we need to be better humans. We need to be better in society. To get that point across. So I'm, I'm open to any suggestions if anyone's got any wordsmithing uh, ways uh, to say it better than to human better. But that's the best uh, verb I've been able to come up with. And doing all this stuff provides lots of co-benefits. So not only do we reduce natural resource use, hopefully, we improve accessibility and UX experience, we can improve performance and speed, and importantly we can fulfill ourselves more as humans by taking action in this area and do more social good. So thank you. I will publish a link to the slides on Twitter shortly. Um, I'm very happy to get into questions. I just want to show you all the other slides that I've put in the back of this slide pack, which you may find helpful. So I've put a whole bunch of tools that you can use for measuring your websites, for measuring uh, if any of you are using cloud and have developers you can work with. I've put a whole bunch of ideas around how you can reduce that data transfer uh, with a few book recommendations. And I've put some additional information about devices as well. I didn't really get time to talk about that today, but actually um, devices are a huge generator of, of carbon emissions. Uh, so when I say devices, I mean like phones, laptops, mm -hmm. computers, that kind of stuff. So there's a whole bunch more stuff in the slides that I hope you might find useful. I'll stop there. And I'm very keen to sort of get into conversation with you all, see what you're thinking, see what your reflections are and see how else I can help you. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. That was, that was amazing. That was really good. Has anyone, anyone got any thoughts or questions for them? I'm sure you've got lots of thoughts for them. <laughs> we had a, a great question from Louise. Louise, I think you just sent it to me, not the group chat, which is fine. Do you want to just ask a question or do you want me to chip it in for you? Yeah, apologies. Um, I was just no wondering problem. if there's kind of any method of measurement or analysis for our digital sustainability. Um, it'd be good to know if there is kind of a method for summarising the need for change, so kind of pushing that across to other people in, in organisations, etc. I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of that question. So 
it was about if there's a kind of method or framework for measuring or analyzing the climate impacts of digital to kind of help convince other stakeholders of the need to to get started with it absolutely so some of the tools um that i've put in the slide pack there a super easy way of doing it is go to something called websitecarbon.com you can put any website i can see you all going off and typing it in there. <laughs> <laughs> i love it when i mention these things how it goes off um go to websitecarbon.com you can put any public facing website in there and it will give you an estimated carbon emission that comes back um, and the really cool thing about that tool as well is that it will also give you an idea of how that ranks compared to other common websites so it puts it into context for you as well i typically find when you're working with senior management that tool is a really awesome way of engaging them because it just gives a very simple number and it, it gives you a good starting point so i would suggest that and i'd suggest starting with public facing websites you know you may have other kinds of tech back office tech or stuff that's not publicly available come on to that later a good starting point is as i say websites um i did also mention louise the sustainable web design website same web design website gosh that doesn't trip off does it well um that website has a really good write-up about the methodology behind how that calculation is done i didn't get time to go into it today but you might find that helpful great thank you um and liz has said you really enjoyed the presentation so thanks for that liz um <laughs> feel free to have a question as well and i guess um Something I was thinking about in relation to that kind of analyzing and measuring, I guess one of the problems is making sure you're measuring the right stuff, because I suppose you want to start with that simple kind of here's some context and perspective, but then make sure that when you adopt some goals or ways you're going to change that they're like the right ones, because I think you were cautioning against the kind of doing the very simplistic, just find a, you know, a, a green energy provider or some offsetting or something like that. I'm definitely cautioning against offsets. Um, yeah. I don't believe offsets are really very valuable given the scale of the crisis that we have around carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. I definitely think though, do start with the easy stuff. I mean, of course, if you're new to this, take the low hanging fruit, the low hanging fruit being switching to a, a renewably powered data centers and looking at reducing the amount, the size of your, your websites. And you can often do that without affecting any of your content at all. Um, so if you've got developers, you can talk to them about ways that they can find to do that. And it often, in a nutshell, comes down to making your videos and images more optimized and just cutting crap out. Um, I highly recommend a book and a person called Jerry McGovern. I don't know if any of you have heard of Jerry before. Some of you are nodding. Uh, Jerry has written, hang on, I have it here. Oh, you're going to go and get Jerry there. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. <laughs> oh, Jerry's, in, Jerry's in Ireland. Um, I have his book just here in my lounge um, okay. called World Wide Waste. Uh, you yeah. can get it online or, I mean, I like reading in paper. I find that easier to read. Um, yeah. So that's his book and he's got a great website and he does loads of talks on this topic and yeah. he gets very practical about micro things you can do very small things that you can do whereas sort of i'm talking a little more generally today yeah and i think he's got a, sorry get it because he's got a great stat about the carbon impact of phones about you know 80 percent of their yeah. car emissions happen before you buy them so if you space out the intervals between replacing devices you can really make a me mega impact on your impact and i guess that then informs like you were pointing out about support the oldest devices so making sure your features in your website are going to stay accessible rather than putting pressure on people to use really new devices all the time absolutely and i mean that's something within the tech industry we have just got to get our heads around is this idea i mean i i speak as a developer as someone that you know loves building new tech but something that we as the tech workforce have got to get our heads around is that we could, this rate of change we keep building new stuff we keep developing new phones we keep making faster this faster that 
more features all the time. Actually, from a sustainability perspective, A, not everyone can keep up, and B, the amount of resources it's consuming to benefit such a small number of people. It's not cool. It's really not cool. Um, so, yes, there's this horrible phrase within Silicon Valley, Valley of uh, go fast and break things, which I absolutely despise. Um, I work with a, a charity called the Restart Project. Maybe some of you have heard of them. They do lots of stuff around uh, fixing, getting communities to fix electronics. They've turned that phrase on their head and they say, no, go slow, go slow and fix things, um, which is a far more. Uh, ah, I like that phrase a lot more. <laughs> There's a couple of things I was just going to pick up from chat. The uh, first one was just uh, Jack's point there about uh, emails and people loading emails with HTML to make them very pretty. And I guess that that thing that agencies are often guilty of, of cramming emails and making them look nice and fancy just so they can charge some more money. And actually, we know that the ones that convert the best are the ones that are plain text and are fairly simple and straightforward. I think for me, that's, that's one of the things, and one of the conversations like, when I'm having with clients, particularly around WordPress sites, is this, this rush for like, right, we need to change the old website and this one needs to just have loads of video content. We need these images and we need all this. And, and actually there's a, there's a bit of an education piece there about the fact that you're going to achieve more of your business objectives if you have a site that's more environmentally friendly. So it's not just here is a nice thing to do, but actually it has real advantages for your organisation. I, don't know, I, don't I love that. I love that point. Thank you, Ross. I'm glad you, you mentioned that idea of actually the content, the words are generally what sells, not the fancy images or the placeholder stuff. Yeah. And there's a clear knock on of impact to sustainability and, and reducing data load there as well. Yeah, nice saying, one, Jack. Good comment. <laughs> yeah, that's no, a really good one. Uh, Susan, Susan's point there about obviously more and more of us working from home or doing hybrid working. Um, and is asking, is there a fair assumption that uh, we should be persuading people to reduce tech impact in light of that? So Susan, I don't know if you want to come in. Are you, are you still there? Yeah, there. You're just not your video. Yeah, I'm keeping my video for sustainability reasons. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just because we're, we're struggling a wee bit to get people in the non-environmental voluntary sector engaged in reducing their being more sustainable at the moment. I think a lot of organisations think, oh, well, we're all working from home more. So we're doing so much already compared to where we were two years ago. Um, why do we really need to worry about anything else? And so I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that sort of balance between, you know, working from home means a lot more digital meetings, a lot more, a lot more like Zoom calls, which are obviously have a much bigger impact than a face-to-face -face meeting, but balancing that up against travelling, is, is it fair to say that working from home is more sustainable? And in light of that, if it is, how can we help organisations to, to start thinking about doing more in terms of reducing their tech? Ooh, what a great question. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, there's a lot to pack in, like, like, to unpick and kind of get into there. Um, do you know, I haven't seen any data that persuades me that one is better than the other when it comes to sustainability. You mentioned there there's that tension between Zoom calls. Yes, they do use more energy, but then so does traveling in use more energy. And if I'm honest, the conclusion that I've come to is that it doesn't really matter. Actually, what matters is the effectiveness of getting your stuff done, getting it done right and getting it done so it sticks and i'd actually argue that the method that you choose to do that is f the end result is far more important than the actual method that you're using to, to make your work happen if that makes sense to you i i it's not clear cut uh, that one is better than the other because as i'm sure you're aware when you're working from home it's a little bit harder to work with your colleagues it's harder to communicate and it's harder to get people it can be harder to get people engaged and passionate and communicated, you know, understanding what's going on. So I, I'm not convinced that that's an argument that really has merit, if I'm honest. It's really interesting because it's, I would say that's a wide held assumption that working from home is more sustainable than travel, than commuting. And so that's really interesting. It's given me a lot of food for thought. 
Yes, I, I think because if you think about sustainability being wider than decarbonisation and you think about it as decision making, as social and all of that wider stuff, it, 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 yeah, it kind of balances out. But if anyone's seen any data or, or, or studies that, that do sort of convincingly say, you know, one is better than the other, I'd love to read it, but I, I haven't found it yet. Wow, I love that question. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, that's, question. that's great. Uh, yeah. Hey, Maddie, Maddie, any ones that stand out for you in the chat box? Um, I think um, somebody had asked about um, measuring their carbon footprint, their social media channels. So I guess that's using the main providers and what that might add up to. Oh, another corker of a question. Uh, love that. Um, now, I am not aware of any tools that, like the website carbon emission thing, where you can just stick in an account and it's going to calculate that for you. I'm aware of a few disparate bits, bits and bobs. Um, <laughs> so I'm aware of a website called, um, oh, I, <laughs> I think it's called Tweet Farts. Um, and it basically uh, gives an estimate of a, a broad estimate of how much CO2 each tweet outputs it's a very small amount but when you sort of add it all up it, it does uh, count it's actually a really really good point that I'm not aware of anybody that's that's got into that market around analyzing social media more specifically um, but I haven't checked in on that for a little while so it might be worth me doing that um, but yes it's often overlooked the impact of social media I mean uh, some things I can say is encourage to encourage you to turn off autoplay on your on the media settings on your social media if you can do that then you'll transfer less data and encourage your your account users to do that too like you know the people that you're, you're tweeting to or instagram to or whatever there are settings to do that um but yeah sorry I can't give you like an awesome answer to that one because I don't know of one and um, we've got a Brilliant kind of longish question from Dave. I don't know, Dave, if you want to share what you just put into chat. Or... Um, yeah, I'll try and remember it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking... Um... Well, Dave, you put yourself on mute. You've muted yourself. <laughs> ah, sorry, I was, I was holding the space bar and then trying to do something else with the same no, no thing. Um, it was just about... Um, Maybe we need to challenge why people are using our websites in the first place. Um, is it because we haven't told them something or we haven't shared information or we haven't done something properly and they're trying to contact us or find out information that we could have done better in the first place? Um, and therefore, if, if we get that first part right, then people don't need to come to us. So it's sort of reducing website traffic in, in a good way, in a positive way, because we've already got the message out there. Um, and one of my favourite phrases is, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So there's a temptation to try and put some tech in there to fix something, but actually maybe that's not the answer. Maybe it's just doing the other job better. Yeah, that's a great point, Dave. Yeah, yeah. amen to that. I think people far too often reach for tech, seeing it as a way of solving things, whereas actually we need to look at our decision-making better. We need to look at how we're communicating better. And we need to think about what are we trying to help people do or get i do think though like websites are an amazing way of communicating with people you know you don't need an awful lot in order to access information on a website um and i mean just kind of coming back to that point i'm sure this has come up in your conversations before but it is definitely preferable to publish information on a website and allow people to access it for themselves than hide it away in a pdf or uh, you know, make it more difficult to access. But I do think you're absolutely right um, that tech is often reached for as a solution where actually we should look at processes or the ways that we're talking to people first. So, yeah, awesome point. I really read that really resonates with me. Yeah, yeah. nice one, Dave. Um, it made me think, for example, from collaborating, because we had the good question from Susan about, you know, remote working has less 
impacts the traveling, but has other challenges. And um, one bad example I experienced, it wasn't with somebody who works here, but it was an external collaboration where they would have a Zoom meeting and screen share so we could all look at the same spreadsheet. And we could have spent five minutes doing it offline before and just kind of got up to speed. But we we're spending time in the meeting kind of looking at this spreadsheet <laughs> as a screen share. And it was the classic, this could have been an email moment. And I guess that goes back to the collaboration point. We had a um, Zoom uh, digi shift with Marissa Goldberg, who specializes in kind of supporting people to work remotely well. And she talks about front loading. So giving people the information up front. So you're not sort of saying, well, we need to have this meeting and then I'll share something with you and then um, do it in a very time intensive way. But there's other ways of kind of enabling people to get to what they need to get to without tying them up into lots of meetings. Um, Ross, do you have any other questions you wanted to pull in? There's one that caught my eye about low cost stuff. Do you want me to take that one while you have a wee look? Yeah, I was, I was struggling with the scroll there. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a lot coming in. Yeah, yeah there's loads. Yeah. Amy well, from GGC, you had the question about things that are, are low cost, so making sure you can reduce your impacts without increasing your costs. And I wondered if we had any examples on that? Yeah, I think like for us, I guess, like things like data centers and, you know, sort of uh, just sort of alternatives to, I mean, without having to uh, have a wee look through the sort of the toolkit and do some research with our dev team, but I'm just guessing that there's going to be like, you know, a cost um, consideration attached to some of the alternatives that are sort of out there that are clearly, you know, better and probably more expensive because of that. So just thinking if there's like incentives, you know, if there's, cause I know there's like a green accelerator that's just been launched, um, the Glasgow City Council, which is all about, um, it's actually based around sort of nature, but it's the whole purpose of it is really looking at the bigger picture and how, um, for example, cause we do do a little bit of stuff with sort of recycling wood and we get involved in different bits and pieces like that. So there's probably like, there's those initiatives that I know of that sort of support, um, turning towards more sustainable options across the board um, and I think of course just even sort of general sort of Scottish enterprise sort of projects they, they do they are, they are sort of pushing for for more sustainability from businesses in general and um, but I just guess just sort of going further down this sort of segment of you know as if if we know of any specific things that would be supporting um, the push towards more sustainability with technology because that is something that you know it's, it's quite a sort of niche area isn't it and it's just it's breathtaking to know that it's like the seventh highest um sort of uh culprit of of co2 you know that's just like people i think when people sort of start to think of all these things you know it's just you know where where we can look at the support you know because if everyone did start doing that i guess it would bring it down but i guess it's going to be a smaller number of people that are sort of turning towards this just now so, so yeah great great point Amy great question I would say that within the tech sector I think it's a, a misconception that hosting companies for example that are running on renewable energies will cost you more in my experience I haven't found that to be the case at all um, in my experience the hosting providers that I use um, are as competitive that the price is the same if not cheaper um, within the UK there are two specific hosting companies that I would recommend one is 34SP well okay so I have to say I'm a WordPress developer so my recommendations are revolve around WordPress so 34SP.com 100% renewably powered um, and they offer uh, free websites to nonprofits as well and they are 100% sustainably powered um, so you can check them out and also crystal crystal with a k so k-r-y crystal spelled like that uh, crystal hosting do manage wordpress hosting and also uh, you know, uh, other kind of hosting that's not tied to wordpress completely competitive um 100 renewably powered and they also do a lot of other stuff around sustainability too they're a good tech company based in the uk um, amongst the big players, the big players such as, you know, if you're looking at cloud services like Google or Amazon, uh, actually Amazon, 
Amazon, not so good. Um, I wouldn't recommend Amazon. Uh, Google and Microsoft actually both do a lot of stuff around renewable energy and are massive players in pushing renewable energy forward. So I, I think it's a misconception that it's... Well, yeah and you know as you see amazon there that was the one that i was dreading you saying because we use amazon for so much stuff yeah. um like amazon web services and it's just you know i think like alternatives to that that's the one that i have in mind i'm like what else could we use instead of amazon um so i think it's like those those types of things like we we rely on amazon um you know and for us as a sort of small social enterprise like that's working really sort of nimble, nimbly and agilely like for us to sort of look at how we would like find an alternative i guess is you know there's a cost associated with that so um i guess just yeah i mean i guess it's just because it feels like there are so many like sort of initiatives that are coming out to you know give small businesses the you know the support to be able to become more sustainable in these ways so I, hopefully we'll start to see some of that support coming through for for tech as well yeah i, I mean if you're you mentioned working with devs and if you're using <coughs> amazon then perhaps you might mention to your devs they might want to look into something called the cloud carbon footprint tool Mm -hmm. which is an open source tool, it's free to use. I believe it works with Amazon. You can plug, it, plug in your Amazon data and it will give you an estimate of your CO2 emissions. And that may help you identify areas where you could at least pare back your operations or, or find some efficiencies and therefore reduce cost. Um, so that might be a tool that you might be worth looking into. Thank you. Um, one quick thought I was going to chip in that I experienced when I worked in a very small organization is looking around and switching off dormant services or dormant accounts is a big one because yeah. very often, you know, somebody sets something up, they try it out, but it maybe gets paused or multiple for some reason. So that's quite a quick way of just um, reducing your digital estate and the amount of data that's lying about. It's also quite good from a security point of view because they're not then sitting out there potentially vulnerable and that and it also means from a, a a workflow point of view you can be more focused on the channels that are actually active you're not wondering why are we on pinterest don't know if everybody still wonders that <laughs> <laughs> and yeah um just in relation to that another quick question that's maybe a bit relevant is we had a nice specific question about is it less intent energy intensive to self-host video or is it better to have it with a platform as an embed great question um was that did that come from lizzie i think yes yes fantastic question um generally i think it's better to use the third-party services such as vimeo and youtube the issue is that self-hosting your own videos is actually technically quite difficult and it can be quite hard to give people good, a good experience. I, it depends on what your budget's like, um, but generally I'm assuming that you're small, small organizations. So using, using their services, I think actually pro provides a better experience for your users. Off the top of my head, I can't remember um, YouTube, YouTube's green policies, but they are, a, obviously owned by google and i know google do a lot of stuff in the renewable energy space um vimeo as i recall are pretty good um as well um so i would highly recommend hosting with someone else because what they'll do is also rate throttle so depending on that they'll sort of detect what sort of size screen someone's using or the capabilities of that screen and then send a more appropriately sized video. That's actually quite complex tech to get right yourself. Um, and the other thing I would say relating to videos is please, whatever you do, do not autoplay videos. It is like the worst thing you could possibly do from a sustainability perspective, because you're just sending loads of data in order to play that video that, that somebody probably doesn't really even wanna, wanna watch. Um, so yeah, great question. Thank you for asking that, Lizzie. <laughs> great. Um, Ross, are you spotting any more? Um, no, no, uh, I was just conscious of time and just, I was gonna ask Hannah if she had any kind of yeah. final thoughts on simple next steps that charities could take. Um, I think, I mean, the, sim the simple thing is, uh, I very much love John's point about deleting stuff. 
don't be afraid to delete old content get cull get rid of it i mean that's something that jerry talks about a lot in his work is, you know delete yeah. i think Analytics. There's, there's almost a relief in that as well that when mm. you know when you do that you don't have that sense of that kind of digital burden of we're spinning lots of plates and, yeah. definitely it's, it's liberating it's liberating to have a spring clean so don't forget we can do that digitally as well um and that also comes back to things like um backups and analytics we haven't really talked about analytics today that hasn't come up yet but there's this belief in tech that everybody should be collecting all this data because you know at some point you might need it or you might find it useful i'm not quite sure i believe that actually in my own experience of working with clients people collect data and then never do anything with it at all um, so my feeling my advice is that if you think you need data to a problem enable that service so for example hotjar enable it for a month when you need it collect the data and then turn it off again you don't need to be collecting and creating all this data all the time um, so that that might be another area for, for folks to think about is uh, you know analytics and data deleting old backups deleting old versions that really it was nice to keep it at the time but maybe you really don't need these things anymore and and have a bit of a cold but yeah, there's loads, there's loads to do. There's lots to go at in this area. So you won't be short of <laughs> short of good steps you could take, I think. Yeah, really, really good advice, Hannah. I think start starting small because it can be easy to be overwhelmed by this. Yeah. John. Definitely. Get measuring your websites on carbonwebsite.com and uh yeah. let's let's see what you know how you're coming, how you're scoring and 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 how you're coming out out with yeah. that. And can I just ask a little question, Hannah? Sorry, I'm squeezing it in, but I presume those calculators will sometimes give you a kind of a checklist or read out of things you could go and do that would be kind of actions to to optimize your website. Website carbon doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Um there's another tool called Beacon which mm -hmm. again is at the end of the slides that does do that um, but I think when you're looking for actions you can take things like Lighthouse which is just a general performance tool or Google mm -hmm. page speed scores will also give you those ideas of actions you can take to optimize they just yeah. won't necessarily equate them to CO2 emissions yeah um, and I guess often the optimization as well as enhancing or reducing energy impacts will enhance accessibility as well so it's a bit of a win-win it's yeah. all connected it's all the same stuff it's all about just making it better for people and then also having this knock-on effect of using less resources at the same time yeah. um yeah so it's all you know i said at the beginning it's sustainability it's all in interconnected you can't really talk about one without talking about the other and it's very true in the tech space you can't talk about sustainability or decarbonization of tech without then talking about accessibility ux experience and mm -hmm. you know long-term costs as well and, and overheads of maintaining all your stuff as well yeah all, all comes comes back to the same place i think great thank you it's been a really wonderful discussion and thanks for the talk um ross did you want to do a final wrap up be happy very happy that was excellent that was really good. it's really really interesting and i'm looking so i'm going to be watching out for this tweet now i think in the interest of not having lots of copies of data flying around we'll rely on that as that's the way you'll find hannah's excellent slides is go to at hanopcan on twitter you don't need to be signed up for twitter to, to do that because you can just look for the tweet but yeah and we'll retweet it as well it'd be really interesting to see that it's it, all it is is a link to a pdf on my yeah. google drive actually yeah. so you're very welcome to share that link and i would say that i have compressed the pdf as well we yeah. didn't talk about pdfs but you can yeah. compress pdfs and make them much smaller so i think the whole slide deck is oh it's two or three meg i think Come, yeah. came down from about eight i think so don't eight. forget to compress your pdfs okay. <laughs> final thought <laughs> thanks very much indeed um we're back at the usual time at the end of next month. Um, so it's, as always, it's 10 o'clock on the last Wednesday of the month. Um, I need to remember what the topic is. I was going to smoothly promote it there. But I think Ross might be able to remember. <laughs> this is, uh, you're, you're relying on my brain to remember when, what the next topic is. I can't actually remember what the next one is. That's really bad, isn't it? It'll be on our website. <laughs>
I was I was too busy uh, thinking that I was going to shamelessly plug the fact that there's a digital trustees event on the 10th. Oh, of May. we'll do that. That's the next thing. We'll talk about the next thing. So, yeah. uh, so we're doing that in partnership with DataKind. So, if anyone in the room is interested in uh, trying to recruit a data professional for your board, then do come along and join us. I'll put the link in the chat box just now. You can sign up for that. All the places are free. Equally, if you work in digital and you're interested in joining the charity board. That's a good place to, to find the charity that's looking for someone like you. So, yeah, and John and I will figure out what the next digital shift is soon, I'm sure. Great. Okay, thanks so much, Hannah, and thanks everyone for this great questions and discussion, and see you next month. Cheers, Hannah. Thanks, everyone. See you all later. Oh, it's very awkward and pointing at the screen.